Did you see the stylish kids? Yeah, welcome to the Young IPA Podcast. I'm James. This is Pete. G'day, everyone. It is the 2nd of July, and this is episode 116. Fun show for you guys coming up. We're going to be talking to Herald Sun columnist Andrew Bolt. Mm. We're going to be getting his views on uh, Israel Folau and a few other things that have been catching, uh, you know, in the news recently. It's a pretty cold description of your well, father. Yeah, it's just a weird one for me. Do I go dad? Is that too informal? Or do I go just Andrew both. Bolt? Or just both. But, all right, so my dad slash Herald Sun columnist. Yeah. You can decide which one is more important in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Uh, he'll be in the show, and we're also going to be talking to outgoing chairman of the IPA. I think for the last two days, he's now mm. former chairman of the IPA, Rod Kemp. We're going to be reflecting on his time at the IPA. He's been chairman for a very long time, overseeing a lot of growth of the, uh, the Institute of Public Affairs. So we're going to be talking to him about that journey, which mm. is going to be a really fun talk. Yeah, his second day after about 15 years of work, yep. we've dragged, we've him, dragged him straight back in. You are not done yet. He didn't actually on the phone. He was sort of like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll come in if you need me to. <laughs> Anyway. All right, cool. Uh, no, he's very excited to be oh, here. He's and we're going to be, we're gonna be uh, having a great chat. Uh, let's talk about some of the main stories that have happened this week. So I think the main one would have to be what's happened over in the Portland Antifa protest with mm-hmm. Andy No. Yep. So if you guys didn't see this, I mean, it was a huge story. It got front page of Reddit, and we'll talk about a few of the other things about it. But basically, Andy No is a journalist. He is with Quillette, the mm-hmm. magazine. And he is covering in a Portland Antifa protest. So there was like a Proud Boys protest. Uh, then Antifa got involved to do a counter protest. And, you know, he's like watching them. And I mean, the videos are all over YouTube. So people start throwing things at him. People start hitting him. And then he does a video and you can just see he got messed up. Like there are cuts all over his face. There's cement in his hair. Like they were throwing milkshakes at him that the Portland police are now saying might have been quick drying cement, which mm-hmm. is basically the same as an acid attack. So he got really lit up. And that is really terrifying because that is the anti-fascists that were doing it. Well, that's right. Um, it, it's really ugly stuff. Like you can see the video is this, not a big guy, this tiny little guy. He's surrounded by these people and like they're punching him yep. and then they're like all laughing and it's yeah, like yeah, hor- yeah. horrible stuff and like they're throwing sh- stuff at him. <laughs> uh, and as you say, they throw the milkshakes, which are actually full of concrete and it's just like these people are bullies. Yes. You know, it's just terrible. No, they're anti-fascist, Pete. Oh, uh, yeah. Some so, may see them beating up a journalist on the street using their fists just because they he like the journalist disagrees with them yeah. as fascism itself. Yep. But I will remind those people that these are anti-fascists. Well, you know, bashing a very small journalist is like killing Hitler. So yep. good on them. Um, well done. You really stood up to a huge power source there. That's right. Ricky Gervais, the famous English comedian, I'm not sure he tweeted this in relation to what happened to Andy, but he wrote, it's interesting that the people who believe, and it was over the weekend, it's interesting that the people who believe that throwing a milkshake in someone's face shouldn't be considered assault are often the same people who believe that saying things should be. Yeah, it's exactly right. Because I saw a lot of people on Twitter, like there was a movement of Andy knows not actually a real journalist, mm. as if that makes it better. Oh, it's yeah. like, well, you know, we're actually beating up an innocent, innocent person on the street. Like by their own logic, if Andy knows not a journalist and therefore it's okay, yeah. you've just beaten up a person on the street. Yeah, you've just beaten up yeah someone <laughs> you don't agree with who's exactly. a troll. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and just, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I saw one uh, this morning, the mayor of Portland tweeted out, Mayor Ted Wheeler tweeted out, Portland has always been a beacon of free speech. We are proud of that history. Okay. All right, Pete, it had 170 likes and 130 retweets. Give me a rough estimate how many replies you reckon that tweet got. Uh, I would say I can... 30 and 70. 5,000. Yeah, you hit it on the head. It is 5,000 exactly. Well done, Pete. Did you see this? I didn't see this, but I do know the internet. So I was glad to get that right. But obviously, I mean, that's crazy. Did he tweet about this other thing at all? Or was that his only comment? That's his only comment on the whole thing. Portland has a history of free speech. And it was after Yeah, you can say whatever you want but a mob will attack you for it. Free speech and free violence. Yes. Uh, And it's one of the great uh, ratios as well because they're now going back through old tweets of his Mm -hmm. and ratioing those tweets as well. It's like a a grenade. It's just keeping on going. I mean, three days ago, he tweeted a photo of him on a hike and now that's been ratioed. (laughs) That doesn't seem, you know, he's still at the hike. Like, yeah. um, But such a terrible event. And, Mm -hmm. you know, he is in hospital now. I think he's going to be okay. He's definitely tweeting again, but... That's terrifying. He was, yeah. He was hospitalised overnight. Check out Claire Lehman's um, tweets about it because, of course, he's her colleague at yeah. Quillette. So yeah. she's got the full story there. That's one of those things like the famous Mitchell and Webb sketch where you got to look at yourself beating up the guy and just going like, are we the baddies? Like, we Are we the bad guys in this situation? The fa- what, When you say famous Mitchell and Webb sketch... I Oh, well, it's a famous sketch. It's am like, I the only person in the world who doesn't know what it is or will other people? I... Lean that way. Okay. Like with most things, I think this cup piece of pop culture passed you by. Yeah, I <laughs> should have waved just, gladly at it as I it should, left. Does, do you know what it was, Diana? Have you heard that before? What? 
that the, the sketch. That's all right. All right, Pete's scrambling, looking for, just I'm looking just, around the room for people. I'm trying to, to find just some some support for my uh, my view. Anyway, yeah, you're not going to find any from me. Let's right. move on. Yes. All right. So the, obviously the big news last week, uh, towards the end of last week, was the Project Veritas Sting on Google. We love a good sting on the IP, Young IPA podcast. Uh, they recorded Google executive Jen Genite saying a number of very naughty things about the platform. Uh, and uh, I'll go through a few of those now. So she said that they so are... So she's the head of responsible innovation in Google? Good fact. Thank good you. fact. Uh, she said um, they will be charged with preventing the next Trump situation, which is a bit creepy. We're also training our algorithms. If 2016 happened again, would we have? Would the outcome have been different? Uh, they've been working on it since 2016 to make sure we're ready for 2020. So basically, this uh, recording of this woman in a restaurant, the Google executive, as he said, saying that the whole system is geared towards ensuring that Donald Trump doesn't win again, <laughs> which to me seems like the very thing you would do if you did want him to win again. Uh, there's been further stuff as well. The Google Insider also released documents to Project Veritas, which, which, which came out last week, showing that the search engine manipulates what information users see based on what is fair and equitable. What Google says is fair and equitable and, you know, uh, what's it called? Spoiler alert. Google are massive lefties, as it turns out. Uh, so at times it filters out or de-emphasizes factual information that its creators deem unfair for example if you google C- uh, ceos uh if on on google you google on google uh a lot of just the, playing right into their hands a lot of the ceos would t- would be men right so that's changed if you googled now now they, they showed this last week do it right now kids out there yep. google men it's like well no google women and it's like you know women can do anything women are great blah, 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 which is all, all good stuff obviously and if, but if you google men it's stuff like men can be pregnant Men, uh, you know, all those crazy things. So check it out. Um, and the final thing they did, an email to Google's transparency and ethics group was sent, uh, was, was leaked by this Google Insider, which a lot of this stuff came from. Uh, it was sent by a fellow called Liam Hopkins to 17 other staff. And I'll just take one quote out of it. Today, it is often one or two steps to Nazis. If we understand that PragerU, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, etc., are Nazis using the dog whistles you mentioned in step one. This is the level we're at. This is where Google are at. Yeah. I mean, the main one being there for me is Google actively saying, yeah, we're definitely trying to make sure that Trump doesn't get reelected. Yeah. I mean, that's creepy. And for people that, like, for a company that goes, you know, don't be evil is on the bill. Well, it was on the bill, but I don't know if it still is. But, like, don't be evil is their thing. Mm -hmm. You're actively saying we're definitely trying to rig elections. Like, forget about Russia. Google is actually, like, yeah, we're trying to do that. That was one of our points. So if they are doing it with... Trump, are they also doing it in other countries? Well, I don't know. With people they don't like or stuff about Brexit? Yeah. And then now what's foreign interference? Yes, exactly. Tell, so Give me that, James. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't give you that. Uh, <laughs> that's, really, that was a truly terrifying look in yeah. your eyes. So for any YouTube subscribers there, we'll know the naked fear I just felt. Um, but that, yeah, so that's the thing is like Google is, I, I, I just can't believe like it, it, everyone's been thinking it for so long. Mm-hmm. That Google is doing all this stuff, and now yeah. we've actually got it on camera. And then, and then YouTube shuts down the video, which is yeah, exactly. yeah, YouTube is owned by Google, so YouTube shuts down the video, yeah. which is a great way of making sure that everyone goes, "Ah, oh, that's not a big deal." Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> they've got nothing. There's to hide. nothing to see here. Yeah, yeah, keep um, moving. And the thing is, they're at the level of like dopey student protesters with their view of the world. You know, yeah. like the idea that so they've definitely not read anything Ben Shapiro's ever done or anything. Jordan Peterson's ever done. Yeah. Putting aside the fact that Ben Shapiro is Jewish and Prager, Dennis Prager is Jewish. Yeah. Like you, that if you read anything they've done, you would know they're not Nazis. Yeah, exactly. If you genuinely in your heart of hearts think Ben Shapiro is a Nazi, <laughs> you should really reevaluate your ability to discern what's fake news and what's not. Exactly, which is another thing they do. So uh, I would say that, um, you know, they're, they're not this neutral platform. They're completely ideological. And I think that we should all get on Alta Vista. Yep. I'm, I'm a big Ask Jeeves kind of guy. I want to bring that back. So why why is Google the most powerful one? Uh, because it's just the best. Is that right? Yeah. It's really, really good. Okay. <laughs> have you tried it? <laughs> yeah, I've tried it. I just don't get it. You know how fast it is? Yeah, but is that worse than other ones? Have you ever typed in a, the most specific question in the history of the planet and something Google comes up with the answer? You reckon you're getting that on Bing? Yeah, oh, I don't know. Bing is the one that automatically loads up on my laptop. Hey, mine too. I reckon this is another conspiracy. Like, no matter how many times I make Google my default search engine, I think Bing just comes straight back. Yeah, well, maybe we should try Bing. But I tried Bing once and it was rubbish. So there you go. Yeah, I think Deanna wants to chime in here. Oh, I was just going to say, speaking of Nazis, um, my favourite thing to ask lefties is what does the S stand for in National Socialist? Oh, no, oh that that's is a good true. One. That See, is... 
this week we're down one eight hundred Burgess hotline, but yeah. I think Deanna, with that kind of withering remark, has really suited uh, the call quite well. Yeah, exactly. The word Nazi is like an English thing. It didn't, like during the war, they were national socialists. Yeah, Mark, if you're listening to this or watching this, I'd be very worried about your job security next week if Deanna's going to come out with gold like that. Where is your research, Burjo? I'm coming after you, Burjo. <laughs> Man, shots are fired. This is good. Uh, okay, um, let's move on to uh, Stormzy at Glastonbury, I think it is. Okay, yeah, no, that's what I've got as well, but I wasn't sure about it. So, yeah. <laughs> But it is the one I've got next. Good so teamwork. You, so this is me, isn't it? Yes. Okay, excellent. UK rapper Stormzy played Gast- Glastonbury over the weekend. He headlined Glastonbury, I should say. By all accounts, it was an awesome show. James caught a bit of it. I caught about 30 seconds of it. Now, he was the first black British artist to headline Glastonbury, and at 25 years old was the second youngest solo artist behind David Bowie. Yep. So he's doing it going pretty well. It's massive. It went off. He's doing more than I am at 25. Are you 25? I'm 25. And uh, he's headlining Glastonbury and I'm here with you. It's a high bar though. Yeah. But these rock stars burn out early as I well. Certainly so. like... Mate, you're hanging out with the king. <laughs> well, that's true. Okay. <laughs> Has... Has he ever had this? Yeah, exactly. Would he trade it all for one yeah. podcast with Peter Gregory? 100, I say yes. Yeah, 100,000 girls at Glastonbury or me. <laughs> I know what I choose. Anyway, so it was massive based on what everyone said. But there were a few political moments. Stormzy got political. Yep. Uh, he said to the crowd, F Boris. Uh, he talked about the disproportionate amount of black people in British prisons and, uh, of course, said F the government. Of course, left-wing politics. I don't think he said F. He didn't say F. He said like, I'll leave word. it up to other people what he would have said, yeah. but it probably wasn't letter F. He said it very F star, 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 as BBC tweeted out. Well, that's right. So uh, he said that he was... He oh, said not BBC, uh, someone else, but anyway. A very <laughs> naughty word. Glad we clarified that. Uh, of course, left-wing politi- uh, politicians everywhere tried to get their claws into him in the hope that a little bit of Storms, his coolness would rub off on them. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who I'm sure is a massive rap fan, said the performance was political. I think he's a massive Stormzy fan, because Stormzy <laughs> keeps on saying how good Jeremy Corbyn is. Does he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's okay. Come on, Stormzy. Uh, he said, so Corbyn said the performance was was political, iconic, and the ballet was beautiful, beautifully powerful. It was pretty good. It won't just go down in Glastonbury history, it will go down in our country's cultural history. Now, our favourite contrarian, Brendan O'Neill, friend of the show, mm-hmm. had a good post on this topic. He pointed out uh, that the review storms he was talking about, like the things about the disproportionate representation of black people in British prisons, was actually a report, a government report, uh, commissioned by the Conservatives. Um, and so when he's sort of re- repeating these figures and saying if the government is actually, you know, quoting the report of the government, and he said, and, and his view of the disproportionate amount of black people in British prisons is the establishment view. So yeah, not very anti The report was also put together by a Lord two sirs in five days. That's right, yeah, yeah exactly. So, so as it Sounds like the worst Christmas carol in the history of the planet, but it also makes for a report on things. It couldn't be. It might be all right. You never know. But uh, as Brendan O'Neill so succinctly put it, Stormzy isn't bringing down the establishment. He's doing its bidding. Good show, though. It was yeah. a very good show. Apparently, so what was your favourite bit, James? Uh, the ballet was really good. And, you know, I'm not the biggest, you know, Stormzy fan. Like, I'm not saying I don't like his music. I just don't know it that well. Mm-hmm. Um, much more into the 70s stuff. But, yeah, the man put on a hell of a show. I can't fold it. Uh, anyway, I want to move on to oh. another story from... Oh, you have more from Stormzy? Oh, I had a few takes, but that's all right. No, please. Well, us. it was just, you know, it's so annoying. Like, why do the left get to always claim the cool rock stars? Like, it's... Because we're always moment. left. <laughs> Yeah, is that they're, it? They're really left. But it's, I don't know. We, just, you spend two weeks walking around with the Liam Gallagher's, uh, sorry, Noel Gallagher's the greatest guy ever because he did a slight left take. Did you know what Liam Gallagher said last week that he had a ba- he bagged Sadiq Khan? Khan, sorry. Yeah, I think everyone's doing that at this point. Well, there you go. Donald so Trump really opened the floodgates I on reckon that one. As the Gallagher's get older, there's hope for it. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, anyway, look, the left are so illiberal, censorious. Yep. They don't care about the economic well-being of poor people. Yeah. I just don't think it's fair. Just wanted that on record. Okay, cool. Uh, we saw, we'll always have Morrissey, who hasn't had a good record in 30 years. Yeah, but he had a couple of good ones. He did have a couple of good ones. All right, uh, I got, uh, all right, so let's move on to final story and then we'll head over to our interviews. So uh, a disabled grandfather has been sacked by the shopping centre Asda over in the UK yep. for sharing an anti-religion sketch by Billy Connolly on his Facebook page. So the mm. guy's name's Brian Leach. He's worked there for five years. He is the meet and greet kind of guy. The guy at the front of the store hands you a bag, says, how are you going? Uh, and because he posted a video to a Facebook page, which is a Billy Connolly sketch, mm. like a Billy Connolly sketch. Can't, put, can't stress that enough. All right, Ben Shapiro, like we're talking yeah. about Ben Shapiro needs to be shut down. Apparently Billy Connolly needs to be shut down now. Uh, and he's got to go. Exactly right. Yeah. And it got characterized as an anti-Islamic re- video. Yeah. But it wasn't. It was an anti-religion video, which was very funny. Yeah, exactly. I like 30 seconds of it. Well, Billy Connolly is the best. He's so funny. He's very, very good. Uh, so what did he say? Uh, you can stick your effing reformation up your backside. <laughs> yep. And, but he was fair and said, 
Uh, stick Mecker up your backside also. Yep. And I think he did it a bit funnier than you're doing it now. Much funnier. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I'm just starting out. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's good stuff. The material's there. I just need to work on the delivery. And but said, that's going to come from time. When a suicide bomber kills themselves, I think good. One less wanker. Oh, <laughs> we can say that. <laughs> one less wanker in the world. <laughs> We've decided now that that's okay. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, so... The part of me isn't exactly what the content of the sketch is. It's that, yeah. like, the, you know, a guy who works as a uh, meet and greet guy mm. at a shopping centre well, apparently, uh, apparently has to adhere to uh, the company's social media policy. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, from now on, I am going to go up to every person that hands me a bag at Coles and Woolworths and stuff, and yeah. I want a complete rundown of all of their political beliefs yeah, before or not I decide whether or not to shop there, if that's the standard we're holding people to. Well, I will stand there for 35 minutes... <laughs> And I want every Just opinion strong. they have. Oh, who's that? Oh, is this slightly problematic? Yeah. So, and, and, and look, he's 54 years old. So he's probably got like 38 followers yep. on Facebook. Um, and look... Oh, and actually, this I just looked at my notes and reminded me of what I wanted to say, which is how notes work. That's how notes work. They made him do this Stasi like apology thing, and then sacked him anyway. So he's done this whole thing. You know, I'm sorry if I offended my colleagues. You know, yep. for this thing that they never saw and, <laughs> and didn't care about, and they know him as a person. And then they sacked him anyway. That's the worst bit because he would have been like, "Oh, this is stupid, but I'll do it to keep my job." Yeah. And he got he got the sack. Yep. Um, and in his farewell message, he says, "You know, like I, I miss my colleagues and I miss my regular customers." So you know, I think Christ. Disabled 54-year-old grandpa. Yeah. And this is what we've done. Yeah, exactly. These are the people we have to go after. Mm. All right. Uh, that is it for the show. Uh, sorry, not the show. The, for the opener this week. That's what they wish. It's a they very wish short show. Very short show. Uh, so we'll now go to our interviews. Uh, before we do, we'll give you a quick rundown on what the IPA has been up to this week. So over at ipa.org.au, you can go read Renee Gorman talking about Wentworth Must Fall campaign. Mm. Uh, this is the thing that's going around University of Sydney at the moment. You said. Yeah, you said. They've got a statue of... Um, William Wentworth. See, it, all right, so here's my thing. So okay. it's a statue of William Wentworth. I want it down because, uh, you know, colonization, we got to remove statues of bad people, et cetera. Yep. I didn't know who Wentworth actually was. And if you need to, like, and then I read the, like, it's originally coming from an article in Honey Soid, which is like the student newspaper. It's a real must read, though. It's a must read. Uh, from Honey Soid, and they're talking about it, and they have to set up who William Wentworth is for like three paragraphs mm. at the start. If you have to set up who the guy is that you're trying to tear the statue down, I doubt you're going to get much pull. That's like, right. Like, if I need to open up a history book just to figure out if I'm mad at the guy or not, it's not going to work. It's the same as the old old mate in the UK. Like, we're talking about it in Australia because you sacked him. Yeah. You could have said, hey, mate, do you want to just take that down? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now I would have heard about it. Same with Izzy. Yeah. You know, I, I would never have read that. No. I'm, I'm not a keen fan of Israel Flowers Instagram page, <laughs> but everyone in Australia has read it. Anyway, yeah. good point. Uh, and that's the, like, and the other part of it is honey soy. I mean, uh, we love making fun of Honey Soy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My opinion is Honey Soy, the entire collective reading are all student activists mm. and the opinion editor for the Daily Telegraph. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, oh, yeah, because he goes, because oh, he or she wants uh, material. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, but if you are at New Sid or if you do care about this statue must, uh, the, the statues campaign, which I know is a pretty big one, so uh, you can go to ipa.org.au to read Renee's article. And you've also got Gideon and Morgan sharing their thoughts on the Israel for last stuff. That went absolutely viral on the Facebook page over the weekend. Uh, so you can go read that, and in about five minutes' time, you can hear what Andrew Bolt thinks about the Israel for last stuff if you keep listening to this show. All right, uh, let's go to those interviews. Let's do it. Okay, we now welcome back onto the show Herald Sun columnist slash my dad was, I think, the billing we put it forward at the start of he the show. He was going to just describe you as Herald Sun columnist. Well, how do you I, I feel thought, about I that? I thought you guys were talking about friend of the program. I like that one. Friend of the program. Friend of the, friend of the program's assured. Yeah. But we were just debating, like, do we go with the, my dad or is that too informal? Is it too weird? Yeah, why what do you Why would you reckon? give it away? I mean, why don't <laughs> so we sound we're so different. different. <laughs> <laughs> we sound so different. We look so different. Yeah, we sure do. Yeah. And one of us has got the best taste. Yes. Thank mm. you. Um, <laughs> the other one, like, you know, I'll at least say my dad, but uh, when I was on the bowl report, you did say Jimmy, which is like the I family in-house nickname. Jimmy! <laughs> he has kept that quiet. Or sometimes yeah. it's... The Jimmy. Yeah, exactly. That's when I've done really well. Which uh, not allowed to do that. Though. No, no, because I've okay. done really well. <laughs> what, an, what an insight into yeah, the Bolt the family, family dynamic. Uh, all right, uh, let's let's have some decorum and order into yeah. this yeah, before yeah, we spiral absolutely. out of control again. So, Israel Folau, the biggest story of like the last two, three, like probably over a month now. Israel Folau against Rugby Australia. Where are you sitting with this at the moment? Like, what are you? Oh, I think it all? it's gone beyond. Israel Folau versus Rugby Australia. Yeah. That could be Israel Folau against Qantas as well and yeah. Alan Joyce. And ANZ. <laughs> and ANZ. I mean, you know, they're, they're being accused of potentially, I mean, we don't know. Yeah. But the uh, the suggestion from some uh, 
people who are expert in employment law is that uh, the Qantas could be at risk of, uh, well, you know, inducing someone to break a contract or uh, maybe even secondary boycott by allegedly, allegedly going to Rugby Australia and saying, uh, hey, what about this guy? We, we can't sponsor you if, if you've got this guy on your payroll. So this is just huge. This is really huge. Yeah, I was thinking if Israel Folau were to repost that image, there'd be a few more people he would add to that list of people <laughs> that would be going to hell. I think he's made a few more enemies in his time. <laughs> well, it's interesting. So, I saw, um, so Israel Folau has essentially been sacked for quoting the Bible, right? Now, I know some people are saying it's just a workplace, you know, a, contract, a dispute over a contract. But basically, here's a contract with, which, if that reading is true, is saying that if you quote from the Bible particular passages, that is so reprehensible, then of course you read your contract. So I don't know that just trying to define it as a mere contract dispute gets around the fact that it actually is about religious freedom and freedom of expression. I thought it was ironic that uh, the mean, you know, when all this is raging about how you can't quote a passage from the Bible without, risk, without getting sacked from Rugby Australia, uh, by Rugby Australia, that... The Governor General's just a new Governor General has been sworn in swearing on exactly the same Bible. Exactly with, with the same those, Bible. So with like, those words in it. Yeah, yeah. Put your hand on it yeah. and swear by, you know, you tell the truth and blah, blah, blah. But do not open the, the Bible <laughs> yeah. and quote what's in it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and at least they, they didn't have the swearing uh, ceremony in at a rugby stadium. Then there would have been a problem. That's true, too. But the thing, too, of course, people put their hand on the Bible and swear, and the, so the Governor General's putting his hand on the Bible, swear by Almighty God, because, you know, basically there's a little in parenthesis, or strike me dead if I, you know, break my, you know, send me to hell if I break my word. Because that's the whole thing. It's so awesome an oath. You put your hand on the Bible precisely because the Bible does determine there's a hell for sinners. But you may as well, you know, otherwise put your hand on the table. I swear by this table or, you know, I swear by this tree I'm leaning on. No, it's the Bible because there's a hell. And Israel Folau cited this hell and he now must go to Hell, apparently, according to Qantas and Rugby Australia and half the commentary in Australia. So you mentioned there uh, you didn't think it was a contract law issue. I know like there is a cohort of our listeners who definitely think, well, you know, this is a free market. They sack someone. They should be able to sack them. Of course. You don't buy that argument? Or no, no. But they, of course they're entitled to sack them. But it's also always a question of moderation. Why do you, why do you sack someone? I think uh, Rugby Australia is quite entitled to... Sack someone, uh, the IPA is quite entitled to sack... Well, not you guys, <laughs> you guys are sacrosanct. No, but, I think know. we've given them more than enough reason. <laughs> and the Our point is too, the point is too, you know, um, you know, if you if you say Rugby Australia can sack Israel Folau, then of course, uh, you know, uh, someone can... A, a, cake, a, a cake shop owner can sack the baker that refuses to bake a gay wedding cake, for instance. I mean, it cuts it every which way. I think the question really here is not the principle... The question really here is the scale of the overreaction. And in here it is, if you quote the Bible on gays, and I know it's offensive, uh, this particular passage to gays, um, if you do, is that really a sacking? Of, should it be a sackable offence? I think that's really the issue. It's a question of moderation or not moderation, not a question of really contract law. I mean, ultimately it would be decided on the basis of contract law. But like I say... Rugby Australia is entitled to sack a player that brings the sport into disrepute and maybe, possibly, uh, you know, turns off sponsors. But is this offence one that is should be sackable? Yeah, so we talk about how it's like spiralled out of control. So It's not spiralled out of control. Everything's been kept under control for too long. Yeah, this yeah. is putting it out in the open and letting the public uh, have a say. And the public is saying, we're sick of people being in our face. I don't consider it out of control. I think it's out and proud and everyone can comment. And this is finally, finally, when you talk about free speech, this is one that people understand and mm. they're buying into it big time. Yeah. but um, It's out of the control of Qantas. That's what I'm trying to get at, <laughs> which is uh, there's a whole lot of people here. And I was going to say, like, who do you reckon is the actual worst villain that's revealed themselves out of this whole thing? So, I mean, you've got Rugby Australia at the start. You've got ANZ. You've got Marshall Langton, Kate Ellis, et cetera. Like, a lot of people have really weighed in a lot with us. Weighed in with questionable opinions about this. And maybe you want to go the other side as well. But, like, who, who do you reckon is just, like, who's really uh, angered you over the last few weeks about this one? Um, I'd probably start with ANZ Bank. Because I think that's going after a bloke's wife, you know. So they ring up uh, New Zealand Netball and say, uh, we're not happy. And now they're saying, oh, no, no, we weren't We weren't saying that they should sack Amiria Falau. Um, we were just... 
making our views known. Well, come on, you know, what, what, what do you think she's supposed to conclude from the big sponsor, New Zealand Netball, ringing her boss? Yep. What do you think that's about? Yeah. You know, and I think that's disgusting. That is just so disgusting. And also think it's so stupid. You know, you've been seeing this public revulsion against what's being done to Israel Folau. And as a bank spokesman, you think this is exactly the moment when ANZ should go even lower and <laughs> dirtier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What? what kind of brain is operating here? Yeah, exactly. Did you have a favourite villain? Oh, my favourite villain in this whole saga is people who are saying this is terrible for gay teenagers. You have ensured that every single gay teenager in Australia has now read this Facebook post or Instagram post, whereas in, mm. you know, it would have just gone into the ether like who would have noticed this stuff like this performative aspect of these controversies actually massively publicize and amplify what is meant to be the hate but it's so interesting isn't it if, if you think you want to what is it you know make what, what, what's that usual phrase you get in silicon valley i want to make the world a better place you mm. know? yeah i want to make the world a better place okay yeah yeah do you every think tech giant making, wants to say it you know smashing for and smashing his wife and jumping up and down and making core celebrity out of this made the world a better place uh, by you, by those standards mm. if you think you know you want you don't want gays to be offended um i would have thought that simply ignoring him would have made the world a better place yeah it, nothing like this would have happened. You're quite right, Pete. You know, <laughs> I think, you know, only five percent of the people who know now about that passage would know about it now. Uh, it's just so extraordinary. But it just goes to prove, I think, what is really one of the agendas here. It's not people wanting to make the world a better place or wanting to gently correct Israel Folau or be nice to anyone else. It is a self-serving. Soapbox, look at me, look at me, look at me. It is a yep. battle for power. It's the excuse, which is why some of the people criticising Falau are worse than he is. You know, they think he is immoral or nasty and they are twice as immoral and twice as nasty. So if nastiness is the measure, you know, of, of why you would do anything, how do you explain the nastiness of Falau's critics? Hmm. Falau simply describes, as I can see, what happens to gays... In the afterlife, if his reading is of the Bible is correct, I mean, there's a lot of Christians who dispute that. So simply a description of what he thinks God will do to gays. Um, if you don't believe in God, then you've got nothing to worry about, along with all the other people he said will go to hell. You've got nothing to worry about, you know. If I said to you, Pete, well, God will send you to the hell and you don't believe in God, well, I think it's water for duck's back. That's yeah, right. I qualified for a fair few of those ones that Israel Folau listed. Which ones are you not Dad, I don't want to hear. I do not <laughs> want to go through the list of what... Keep it secret. Yeah, as I will, far as I'm, I'm just saying... You're a I'm saint just, on two legs. Yeah, I'm just saying that Israel Folau, like definitely thinks I'm going to hell and I thought about it for literally 0.2 seconds when I first saw it. Like, yeah, you're not I don't, worried? You're in sleepless nights? I don't believe in hell. I doubt I'm going there. And I know you haven't come to me saying, Dad, I've, uh, I'm now worried. I can't sleep. I'm going yeah. to hell. Yeah. Israel Folau has said that my lifestyle is bad. <laughs> like, oh. the, these are shattering I, I revelations This is to what me. I want to hear. I, as far yeah. as I know, you, you eat salad and you go to bed at 9 o'clock every night. And that's the way uh, we'll keep it. But uh, I, I would put forward, I think you found this one, uh, or you put this on your blog yesterday, the Marshall Langton stuff. Well, she started oh. tweeting about how, like, a, a person on Twitter who was gay who defended Falau, she was like, well, I doubt he's actually gay. Really? <laughs> no, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't that the idea? idea? It was even worse than that. Okay, so, so this is what I mean about how people are using some of these moral issues in this, this Twitter time, and not to make the world a better place, not to uh, make peace and harmony and love rule. It is really to get one over someone else, to do them in the eye, which is why they sometimes act worse than the person they criticise. Uh, they are what they condemn or perhaps even double. And Marsha Langton, to me, seems to fit that mode. Here is a Melbourne University, Redmond Barry, distinguished professor, no less. Yeah, not just your regular average professor. No, not your undistinguished one. Yeah. She is a distinguished one. That's her title. Um, so, you, so here we have the sin... Israel Folau is being condemned for, that he will go to hell for, is being mean to gays. Being mean to gays. A gay guy says on Twitter, hey, I actually am gay and I think Magda Sabansky, the actor, she, while I like her a lot, I don't like what she's saying about him. He's too mean. A reasonable point of view. Marsha Langton piles in 
Remember, the sin, the sin that's caused all this is being mean to gays. It says, you're gay? I think you're just being masturbating too much. Hell, and what? when people call her out on that, she says, uh, well, I don't think you're gay anyway. I think you're twisted, like Milo Yiannopoulos. Now, that seems to me a homophobic slur. That is way worse than anything against Ralph <laughs> Ralph Far Ralph. worse. Yeah, that is way worse. So and, worse. It's, and it's not saying God thinks this about gays. This is her saying, <laughs> yeah. I think this is about gays. Yeah, I, so in terms of pinning a moral blame on someone, that's far more, Marsha, you said that because that's your opinion as yeah. opposed to saying, Israel, don't quote God's opinion. But just but, like the word twisted. Twisted. Where, like that's not been really said about gay people since like the 1940s when they didn't know what it was. They like, just twist it. I can they, make it come back now. What's well, the next step to gay conversion? Yeah, uh, exactly. Let me just untwist it. Yeah, if you were less just, twisted, you wouldn't be gay. You're just confused. You don't really you know just, what you uh, want. You've been masturbating yeah, too you, much. You've just Keep gone your hands over the time in your life. And you'll be okay. You're what's be the fine. masturbating bit? So she thinks gay people were people that masturbate too much. She said this guy... Masturbated too much. He thinks this game is probably masturbated. Yeah, this is the most time we've spent discussing that particular topic on this podcast. <laughs> oh, okay, no, that's a, yeah. Don't forget, we're talking about someone who is the Redmond Barry Distinguished mm. Professor of Melbourne University. Yeah. So not an ordinary professor, no. and this is her opinion. I wonder, Crikey. should she really be at Melbourne University? What's Melbourne well, University? Let's review the contract. Uh, <laughs> let's review the contract. Review Has she contract? brought the university in disrepute? What will the sponsors think? Yeah, uh, I want to go back to something. Oh, uh, we're by talking the way, about. James, as a, a former, as an alumni of Melbourne University, yeah. yep. she also said, "And is conservative, so ignore him." Mm. What do you think Marsha Langton's opinion of conservative students would be, given that? Uh, what's her opinion of you? Well, I'm not a conservative, but. Uh, Look, you know, I, I don't have anything to do with Melbourne University. We did University. complain to Melbourne University Vice-Chancellor about something she uh, tweeted regarding you. So anyway. Oh, okay. Go. Well, I missed that. Um, first, I'm hearing about it. Live on mm. air. Uh, <laughs> this is definitely something just, for me to Google a bit later on. Family moments just unfolding before my eyes. Yeah, Can absolutely. I, that point, though, about how oh, it's kind of like when a gay person or someone, you know, of a minority has a conservative or a liberal point of view, it's like, oh, they're not real. Don't, let's just completely dehumanise, like how we always pretend that conservative and liberal women don't exist. It's not a legitimate point of view. You must be sick, evil, uh, you know, false, false consciousness. Yep. There, there, there's something wrong with you fundamentally. Yeah. So you must be treated or beaten. Beaten is also good. We see that too with uh, the beating of Andy No, yeah. uh, uh, and in Portland uh, on the weekend. Uh, you must be beaten uh, or... Uh, me uh, to attack in the street. How about that? That'll make you change your views for the better. You know, a <laughs> bit little, of glitter. Yeah, a little heal. You know, a, a beating might heal you. I mean, that's the Antifa way. I mean, it's just so extraordinary, and it's it's a it's a phenomenon. You, I'm sure you know. You know, people of the right, of conservatives, or in James's case, libertarians, tend to think uh, people of the left, where you, there's a dis disagreement, they're simply wrong. Whereas people of the left be more tribalists, and it's not s simply of the left, but tribalists generally tend to think that people who don't think the same as them are not wrong, they're evil. And I think this is a really, it's a lack of respect and a lack of, you know, wanting to have a debate, a dialogue, that I think is really poisonous, and particularly poisonous in our universities at the moment. Yeah, uh, I want to come back to something we were talking about before, which is when Pete said this amplifies like the exposure of the Israel Falau post ads. Like, I kind of doubt anyone actually, like, genuinely cares about Israel Falau's political beliefs. Like, I think there's a lot of fake outrage about this. I mean, you get this with Sleeping Giants. Like, how many people actually, like, their day gets changed because of they were offended by what was said at, you know, 10.47 p.m. on Sky News. I don't know what's, well, I don't what know what's on there. Earlier. Might be a great show, but I, <laughs> it might have been the height of... David Spears. Uh, David Spears. Well, he's good, and I don't think he's saying anything to get Sleeping Giants. Well, can, <laughs> I just, uh, can I just uh, check that inflection you had? Yeah. So we're talking about Sky News. I said David Spears, and you said, well, he is good. I just said no. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, I, I that, was, he is good. Did you pick that up for mm. uh, I picked well, that up. So anyway... As opposed to the guy that's on 7 o'clock. Who's that? Anyway... <laughs> My point being, like sleeping giant, like I just think the whole concept of the out, like the online outrage over what people say, is the most overblown narrative in the media. Like the second someone says anything, it's like look at all these responses, I, I and it's three tweets from people with a collective following of fifty-seven, and it's you know look at this withering response, no retweets, two replies, and, and one love. That heart. is so correct. There's two things there. You, uh, you're thrown 
two bits of red meat at me. Yep. Uh, let me just deal with that last one because that is such a bugbear of mine. There's such lazy journalism going on now. Yeah. You're quite right. So many news stories, you know, you see them in various papers, news.com.au. That's my own employees. I don't mind singling them out or um, uh, some, uh, Fairfax or now nine newspapers. Daily Mail does it too. Some journalist sits on their shiny backside in an office. They don't talk to anyone. They just go through the various tweets that they think are the nastiest ones they can find or ones that subscribe to the point of view they want to put, you know, who agrees with me? Let me go. Oh, this is uh, Daisy, Daisy Fishcutter. Uh, two followers. Uh, that's all right because it's so it's nasty. It's always like 4,700 tweets, 34 followers. Like, like that's just exactly. like in complete level of imbalance. Correct, correct. And uh, often someone who's a made-up name, yep. right? Uh, so, you know, Sir Sir Davos, you know, um, tweeting. Yeah. Uh, and that made-up name. Made-up name, no followers, but because they're really, really nasty, let's put them in the paper as a as a token of the public outrage. As a distinguished professor of the public sphere. Yeah, exactly correct. It's like going to, uh, you know, the local urinal <laughs> and, and scraping the worst graffiti you can find. You don't know who the hell wrote it. You don't know if they're stark, staring, raving mad or they've been since confined to, uh, you know, a mental asylum. But it's a really nasty one. So let's put them in the paper as, in a, as a token of the public outrage at this terrible person that you want to condemn. I think it's just such a the laziest journalism. And I call it out. I really call it out. But what was the other aspect you want? Oh, yes. Yeah, Sleeping Marsha Giants. Langton and Sleeping Giants. And you say, uh, well, they're not really, they're not really outraged. They're... But that goes to the early point. I reckon a lot of this is not about making the world a better place. Uh, as Marsha Langton once uh, said on a video that I showed on Sky this week, it's not about that at all. It's about uh, showing that you're a much more moral person than the person whose uh, face you're pulping. You know, you smash them in the face, that'll teach them, and you're much more moral. And how often do you see this, that people... There's a great quote, I'm trying to remember who it was by, whether it was Chesterton or someone like that, that it was just someone... There is something merciless and pitiless and there's no stop to someone who thinks they're moral and is improving you because whatever they're doing to you is for your own good, even if they're just, you know, kneeing you in the groin and uh, ripping your arms off. It's for your own good, for your own good. You know, it hurts me more than it hurts you to pound your nose in. Yeah. Well, Game of Thrones spoiler coming up, but I thought that show absolutely nailed it with that last <laughs> Daenerys scene. <laughs> We're just like, well, the, you know, this is the way it has to be to get to Utopia. And it's like, well, how many people have to get hurt on the way there? Well, you see, the greatest mass movement, I mean, there aren't too many people who actually think they're evil. When yeah, doing what there's no doing. like snidely whiplashes in the world. Like, how, how do I make people suffer today? Well, look, if you ask the uh, Nazi party, uh, members of the Nazis, yeah. uh, do you think you are evil? Uh, I bet that 99% of them thought they weren't. By the way, did you know that green groups in Germany had a huge rate of enrolment in the Nazi party in the early 30s? It's true. It's something like 70, 80 percent. Been a study about that. Isn't that an interesting? Um, but that, no, they actually think they're doing good. The Khmer Rouge, they thought they were doing good by killing one quarter of the population. This is the point. Why do people do such evil things when they think, they think they're doing good? One is no breaks. It's for the good of humanity that I must nail you to a cross. Yeah. The good of or humanity that I must, must put you in front of a uh, firing squad. Yeah. All those Bolsheviks making the world better, one corpse at a time. Yeah. Or just beating up Andy Noel on a street in Portland. Or ban beating up Andy Noel on a street in Portland. I mean, have you seen anything so frightening lately on video in your life as what happened to that guy? Photojournalist, uh, Quillet editor, conservative, critic of Antifa. Here you have Antifa, a group that calls itself anti fascist. Again, what I'm talking about. More fascists than anyone they're fighting. They are the fascists. They're not anti-fascists. They are the new fascists. Um, they've got a reputation in Portland, which is the most most woke city in America, would you say? Absolutely, yeah. There's a reason they called it Portlandia and not any other city. Correct. They pick on this guy, Asian and gay. Can you believe it? Can you imagine if Trump supporters beat up mm. a guy who was Asian and gay? Yeah, at a rally. You wouldn't hear the end of it. No. You have heard I mean, look what this. happened to that kid from... Uh, well, I can't remember the school, but the, the kid that just smiled at a Native American. Oh, the Covington. Oh, yeah, like, Covington. yeah, the Covington kids. Yeah. Like, that was two weeks for a smile. Yeah, simply like, smiling. Man, imagine if you started beating the hell out of him. C correct. But these are Antifa, so it hasn't had the currency apart from shows like mine and yours uh, and, you know, some uh, websites, etc. Uh, Andy No, gay, um, Asian, 
uh, goes to a anti-fascist rally and gets the tripe smashed out of him by people who recognise him, masked people, several, punching him in the face, leaving with cuts and bruises. His face is a sight to behold. Throwing something at him that could be milkshake or uh, fast well, Portland, setting. Yeah, Portland police said, we understand some of the milkshakes might have been quick drinks and man, if you were hit, Which, like, yeah. let us know, because that's like an acid attack. Throwing things at him, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just sheer hatred unleashed. It's a licence to beat up people. Exactly what you saw in the Stormtroopers, the Red Guard, the Khmer Rouge. Uh, we're moral, so we're entitled to do anything. And I think this is a real tendency. I, I, know, I know it's easy to catastrophize, but the point is if a movement is not stopped early, it grows. And there must be a resistance. So you must see the direction they're heading to. And so right now that whole thing, this whole... Uh, ethos of the left thinking that conservatives are not, or libertarians, James, are not wrong, they're evil, this is where it leads to. Because once you start thinking people are evil, you're entitled to do almost anything you like to them. We have to insist there is a debate. And you see now the left doesn't have a debate with what they call climate deniers, by the way. Notice deniers, deliberate cho cho choice of to link it to Holocaust denial. Because it's too e they're too evil. And you see the ABC does not give a platform. This is the small beginnings of where you end up with the Antifa rights, uh, beating up of Andy No and beyond. Once you start demonising people as evil, you do evil things to them quite often. So you yourself have been a victim of a far-left attack in the street. Would you have any advice for Andy No about how to handle a situation like that? Well, I only had two people attacking me. Mm -hmm. He had quite a few, yep. and some armed. Um, I, w I would probably still fight back, but you're not going to win in that one, and I don't know what to do. I thought he showed such dignity. My advice is get it filmed like he did. I don't know whether he, someone did it on his behest. So there was someone filming him filming it as and he was shaming left, him after. and then he, once he was safe, he immediately did a live broadcast explaining what was That's happening. That's what you did. And including the police coming it. over. Yeah, yeah publicise it. Mm. Yeah, where he said, where were you? Yeah. A good question. Yeah, very good question. Mm. All right, cool. Um, unless, do you have anything? Well, we, I think we have to cover Joffa. Oh, okay. That's very important. Joffa. So Joffa was on. Uh, how'd you find Joffa on the show? Well, uh, I thought Joffa was terrific. I picked him up as a guest from your show. Okay. I thought you did such a good job, I'd do, uh, I'd do the same. I thought if it worked for you, it would work for me. Yep. Uh, so he came in the show. I thought it was, re I think it was terrific. I mean, he plays against the, a type almost, you know, like. Uh, you think the head Collingwood fan, the chief, the head of the fan squad of Collingwood is going to have no teeth <laughs> and uh, be sozzled. I brought him in for whiskey with a mate and he made me put a cork back in the whiskey bottle because he doesn't drink. He yep. said his father had been an alcoholic and I, I felt so ashamed that I put that away for one week. <laughs> the whiskey bottle came back the next. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was great. I mean, working with Salvation Army and all that, but... While he described himself as a man of the left, he was also really upset about free encroachments on freedom of speech. In this particular case, it was the AFL's. Uh, what do they call them? Behavioural awareness officers. <laughs> yeah. Straight out of Orwell, isn't yeah. it? Just you, be aware of your behaviour. Yeah, and we'll tell you how aware of your yeah, behaviour. We are very we aware. Are, we are very, <laughs> are very aware. aware of your behaviour. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so he was against and led a public revolt against that. We've seen now the public revolt too with the Israel for Lau case. I think people have really had it with people in your face. Yeah. Really had it. Now, you know, nothing's all one way or all the other. There is bad behaviour and calling it out is not political correctness. It's That's how we've always done it. Bad behaviour needs to be called out. Otherwise, you get more of it. But there's a question of scale, of moderation, of appropriateness is the... Is the punishment fit the crime? Um, and I think in a lot of cases it's not. And in a lot of cases it's not about making the world a better place. It's about someone else uh, seeking power over you. Yeah. I want to ask you about the whiskey with a mate segment because when I was on... Some? No, <laughs> well, not just now. We should drink during our podcast. We should. We, we it would be such a better podcast. Mm. Uh, we're, well, much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was on Whiskey with a Mate, yeah. like, I spent most of that day thinking about like, just don't be the first guy to cough. Like, just don't have the sip of whiskey and go, <clears throat> like, too strong for you. Has anyone ever coughed or has there ever been, like, an interesting one, response? You know, this is my very, very favourite one that's now gone. 
there was only about a thousand bottles made, and I got it in uh, St Andrews in Scotland, and I can't find another. I've only had two bottles, found two bottles. That's it. They're gone. And it's like jet. It is so good, but so big. And I gave, I think, a sip to Nick Minchin. I should never have done it. What? I only had two bottles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, cheap stuff. Yeah, and I think uh, that's he, a friend of the show talking about there, Pete. He, 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 his chair hit the back of the studio. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is brilliant. But you know this thing about not coughing on TV. You know when I first started on TV, I was terrified about imperfections like that. Mm. Um, and now I don't care so much. It's a little rough grain that makes it more real. And if you don't get phased by it, then often the viewers won't either. As long as you you know. As long as you're just talking to people and it's part of natural life, people mm. don't care so much. I mean, of course, you don't want to sneeze and snot all over the uh, screen. That that's no good. <laughs> but, Pete's battling um, a sickness today. <laughs> I'm literally about to cough. Like this, so, <laughs> well, I know you've been coughing. You know, I've, my gosh, I've had that. Mm. Coughs really get to my chest, and on TV it looks terrible. Oh, we're on TV, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, we're yeah. filming these now. Yeah, yep. no, it looks terrible. I'd hold that in if I were you. Uh, that's what I'm worse, working on. <laughs> no. Tears rolling down your cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So, as anyone, Don't my question cough, was: Has anyone uh, finished the whiskey and said I need some more? Yes, yeah, someone did. Uh, was it Sam Newman? Oh, no, no, we, I think it was. <laughs> it was no out. further evidence <laughs> needed. <laughs> cool. Well, the what, it the, finished it by the time Andrew had finished introducing it. <laughs> Just no, up. no, Sam's a good guy. Sam is a good guy. All right, cool. Uh, That's all right. a free speech warrior. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, so Andrew slash dad slash yeah. Well, we don't have the nickname for you. I'm Jemmy. We don't have one for you. But anyway. <laughs> the Jemmy. They're Jemmy. All right. So Andrew slash dad, thanks so much for coming on the show. What a pleasure, guys. See you next time. Thank you very much. Okay. We now welcome onto the show former chairman of the Institute of Public Affairs, uh, a fresh, freshly two days into uh, the post chairman phase, and we've brought you straight back into the office. So Rod Camp, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. Pleased uh, to be here. Uh, so you're chairman through the, a huge time of growth of the IPA mm. over the time. Uh, what do you make of where the IPA is at today? Well, the IPA is um, what I would describe as uh, a unique organisation. Uh, there is nobody in Australia that does the work of the IPA. Uh, we are leading policy debates in a, a range of areas that uh, uh, many organisations uh, uh, pussyfoot around. Uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, uh, climate change uh, are two where the IPA has uh, played a leading role and I think has had a significant influence uh, already on government policy, but uh, we have a fair way to go uh, in both those areas. Is that what you put down the IPA success to, what you said that other, other organisations pussyfoot around the big issues? I think that's the case. I think that uh, there's a, a, a very wide group of Australians that actually uh, are very sceptical of what they read in the media, um, are probably pretty sceptical about sort of uh, the issues that many in the political process adopt, both political parties. Uh, want to see the is issues that they're concerned about addressed. Uh, I mean, another one, for example, is uh, school curriculum uh, and the work that the IPA uh, is doing in that area and uh, also the, the, the teaching of history at university. Uh, the, the Western Civil Civilization uh, program is very important and uh, people out there like that and they believe that these issues have got to be properly addressed. Yeah, just like with uh, the Israel for Our stuff right at the moment is there's no real big free speech group in Australia apart from the IPA that comes out and says all this stuff. I mean, uh, it's basically just been Israel for Our on one side and us and then against, you know, Rugby Australia, ANZ and all these other people. And I think that makes the point I was making. When you think how many human rights um, organisations are there? Yeah. I mean, there would be, you know, 10, 15, I suspect, we, we could put together. How many uh, law faculties are there around Australia with human rights professors? Uh, how many lawyers uh, have been allegedly taking an interest in human rights? But they're very selective in which of the human rights they're concerned about. Yeah, it's never freedom and, of speech. And, and they're not all that concerned about what's happened to uh, Falu. They, they couldn't care less about it and they, and they aren't part of the debate. Mm. So I think the kind of people that you're talking about out there are what Scott Morrison described as the quiet Australians after his election victory. 
Um, so did, what, do you, what, what did you make of that victory? Did you think that's a, uh, an optimistic thing for the future of quad Australians? And how do you think it'll play out? Well, I think the, the first thing I could say about the victory was it was a great surprise. Yeah. <laughs> and I think uh, you only have to speak to uh, people who are insiders in the Liberal Party these days. And I think uh, there were some people who believed there was a road to victory, but they were very few and far between. And I think a lot of the debate was uh, trying to save the deck chairs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we saved a lot of deck chairs. And apparently. they saved a lot of deck chairs and they saved the ship, actually, <laughs> uh, which was a remarkable effort. And congratulations uh, to the people that were involved in that. I think Morrison and, and ran a fantastic campaign. I haven't met Andrew Hurst, uh, who's the uh, executive director of the Liberal Party, Federal Liberal Party, but uh, he obviously had a major role as well. And it was a very disciplined campaign. Um, I think, you know, uh, luck went with them. I, I think they were lucky to have Bill Shorten as an opponent. Mm -hmm. They were lucky to have um, a, a policy fr a framework to attack. I think the Labor Party had become very arrogant uh, and were putting out policies which they, in, the, uh, in relation to their climate change policy, which they refused to cost. Uh, their tax policy uh, offended many uh, Australians. Uh, and, then, and then openly saying, if you don't like it, don't vote for us. That's right. Yeah. I think there was an arrogance there. Uh, I thought that uh, one observation I read, so this is not original to myself, but one observation which I thought was rather good is that the very poor campaign that we'd fought in the previous election uh, had given the, the Labor Party uh, an excess of confidence uh, and so they rolled out a, a range of policies which they believed that they could sell or at least wouldn't be subject to the vigorous attack by the Liberal Party. And uh, I think uh, they were proven to be wrong and it was a, a very big strategic mistake. Uh, I was involved in the um, 1993 fightback campaign and that was the where uh, we lost the unlosable election, allegedly. Well, the Liberal Party lost it and uh, I think this was an even worse uh, er, um, mistake by the Labor Party that uh, they'd won 40 polls or so in a row. Uh, the Liberal Party couldn't seem to shift those polls. Uh, they went into the, the uh, campaign uh, brimming with confidence and um, they were rolled over. It was an astonishing victory and all credit to the people involved. So you mentioned the, the fight back campaign. You have had a long and distinguished mm. career for liberty in uh, Australia. Um, I think that puts you in a unique position to talk about the future. Mm. So what do you think, you know, are you optimistic about the future for liberty in the world? And um, what, what makes you optimistic and what makes you concerned? Well, I think I would be concerned, actually. Um, I'm hopeful but concerned. Okay. And, and there are battles to, to be won, major battles. And uh, we're seeing that the, the front constantly changes. Um, uh, one of the very big changes since uh, I was the executive director of the IPA in the 1980s is uh, the behaviour of, uh, of big business and business corporations yeah, okay. who um, we would have counted them strongly on the side of free enterprise, and this is a, an odd thing to say, and uh, in, in the 1980s, and mm -hmm. the IPA was supported by a, a lot of major companies um, in Australia. Uh, that world is, is completely gone and now, quite rightly, a lot of the major companies uh, are not on the, the, uh, um, the parapets defending and aggressively promoting pre enterprise but uh, seem to be into virtual um, virtue signalling. Yeah, they're calling up uh, the employers of Israel Folau's wife. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, uh, quite rightly, they, they've taken a lot of flack over that. Mm. And I think people are starting to wonder whether these big corporations that presumably have a... Uh, sometimes hundreds of thousands of shareholders uh, are properly representing those shareholders. And uh, they've decided, uh, I think in some part probably encouraged by their um, corporate relations divisions uh, to, be uh, to become involved in a range of social issues where there is very big, big differences uh, in the community. And it's not surprising that they're copying a, a sort of great deal of flack at the moment. What about globally though? Do you have a, a view on that? Well, an awful lot depends what happens in America, That's doesn't right, it? yeah. And uh, what happens with Trump. And uh, if you saw the, the 20 or so candidates that are running against, uh, hoped, uh, um, you know, put their hats in the ring to become the presidential candidate uh, opposing Trump, uh, you'd have no confidence that uh, the Democrat Party is one which is... Uh, 
going to be a promoter of liberty, it seems to me. I have me. a lot of faith in Marianne Williamson. <laughs> I think she's well, going to be the one a, to lead us. That was a great, that was very odd, that wasn't it? it was, uh, <laughs> you know, to have that, it, it made it an, a very unserious uh, effort, I think, uh, uh, by the Democrats. And uh, look, an awful lot depends on Trump these days, and um, Trump is very hard to predict. Mm. That's true. All right, uh, so let's talk about, so you are no longer chairman. Uh, mm. Janet Olbrexon is the new chair of the yeah. IPA. So uh, why, why are you excited for her to come on? What do you reckon she brings to uh, the IPA? Well, uh, Janet has a very high public profile mm-hmm. and uh, we all know what uh, Janet thinks because we all read her columns <laughs> religiously and her uh, columns we've, she's been writing for five to ten years um, uh, certainly uh, philosophically um, very much in line with the type of ideas that the IPA has been promoting over this period. Uh, so I think uh, Janet will bring a very high public profile. She'll uh, be a, a very strong voice for liberty and free enterprise. Um, she's an exceedingly good media performer, Janet. Uh, so I think it's a very exciting time uh, for the IPA. and. Uh, yeah, we've had a very strong period of growth, but uh, I remain hopeful that this will be turbocharged by Janet, and uh, I'm sure that will happen. Yeah, we're definitely we're going to try get on the show in the next few weeks. Mm. She's our boss now, so yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's right. Um, now let's get a little bit nostalgic. Yeah. Okay, so you were. Uh, Executive Director of the IPA, Senior Member of the Howard mm. Government, a Howard Cabinet Member, yeah. uh, now Chair of the IPA. Long contribution to freedom in Australia. What is your most uh, proudest achievement? Well, probably the hardest thing that I did in politics um, was actually to take the GST bill through the Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the Assistant Treasurer, I was in charge of of, uh, taking those bills through. And it was the longest debate in the in the Senate since the Communist Party (laughs) dissolution bill in the early fifties. And uh, it was a very long and aggressive debate. I was, um, the Labor Party were being supplied with questions by uh, Labor lawyers and Labor accountants and I had to stand up each day and uh, explain, you know, how the GST would be applied and yeah. uh, in my mind was always the Hewson birthday cake. I don't know if you are yeah, old enough to remember it, I'm but uh, Hewson had to explain how the GST sort of would impact a birthday cake. Now. Um, if you actually see the YouTube of that, he didn't do a bad job, but the, but the it, it came out and the, the press certainly picked it up as a, a bit of a disaster for uh, the Liberal Party in the fight back campaign. So taking those bills through the Senate was a, an enormous effort and the Labor Party would question me all day in question time. So I'd, I'd have, a, you know, up to 10 questions in question time. and. Immediately after that period, the debate on the bills had resumed, so I could barely pick up my papers from question time and get myself close to the advisor's box when the uh, the, the debate would start again. So, look, uh, it wasn't particularly enjoyable, but it, in a sense it was um, a bit of an achievement. Uh, one of the things I am proud of is that I think I was... Uh, uh, played a key role in getting up the whole role of international treaties and UN uh, treaties and ILO treaties uh, and the impact that they had on Australia. And that became quite a topic of public debate. And it wasn't uh, before you know, the, the campaign I started to run. And uh, the imposition of international law, uh, often through the courts and court judgments, um, without... Uh, the role of our parliament being effectively uh, involved, uh, I think was important. And uh, we did have a significant effect. There's now a joint standing committee on treaties which examines these treaties uh, before they're uh, brought before the parliament. Uh, that's, a, that's a big step forward. All right, brilliant. And uh, last question. So you're well known for your ability to tell a story. So what would be your favourite story of your time in the IPA? Is there a particular one that stands out for you? Oh, that's a very uh, difficult question. Yeah, question without (laughs) notice. I apologise. There there are many, uh, many favourite stories. But uh, I think, look, the the big story is really um, what has happened under the leadership of John Roskam. And we have to give a, a, a lot of credit to John uh, for uh, the work that he did and the leadership he's shown. I mean, the, the IPA was struggling when John uh, John was appointed uh, as executive director, and uh, John's role over this period it would be, I, I guess, what sort of twelve years? Yeah, or, something or longer. like that. Um, uh, the IPA has grown. Um, he's uh, been able to recruit 
very effective people like like you gentlemen here. Oh, really? <laughs> well, who <done> that? <laughs> and uh, I think I think that that's been extre extremely important. Uh, the IPA. Just let me just close on this. Part of the role that we're playing now is. Uh, helping to train a new group of people for public debate. And as you know, you come into the IPA, um, you'll be involved with writing major articles, you'll be involved with, with the, the media and podcasts, uh, you'll be involved with producing journals, uh, raising money, uh, appearing on the radio and TV, and people are being trained, you know, to uh, in a way that I don't think uh, other organisations do. Uh, and that's why you see on the, in the radio, on the radio, and in TV, on TV, you know, so many IPA people uh, because they're they're good at their job and they're able to clearly express views, and uh, they're putting a message out there which is extremely important. Um, so that's the thing which I find particularly exciting about the way the IPA has developed uh, over the last decade or so. All right, brilliant, Rod. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you to uh, Andrew Bolt and Rod Camp for those interviews. Mm. Very interesting stuff. All right, let's fly through. For the real heavyweights. The, yeah, much heavier than us in the weight, <laughs> you know, in like the yeah. in the grand scheme of things. In their achievements. Yeah. Uh, all right, let us go through some of the stuff that's made us laugh this week. Yeah. And we could spend all day on our first topic here. Marion Williamson. Yeah, we should. We, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to ditch the rest of the show. There will be no more interviews. Unlucky Andrew. Just this. Unlucky Rod. If we got Marion Williamson on the show. Oh boy. We should do um, that. All right. So Marion Williamson is running for the Democratic nomination. She was in the debate. Uh, she had one of the great all-time closing statements in history talking about how she will harness the forces of love to fight Donald Trump, who has the forces of hate. Mm -hmm. uh, very inspirational stuff. Yep. And uh, her appearance has now dug up a whole lot of old tweets she sent. She's an author. She spent a lot of time in like, the spiritual kind of self-help kind of world. Yeah. Pete and I are both making the uh, movements. Yeah. Uh, you know exactly what we're talking about here, this kind of person. And all of her old tweets are now getting dug up as uh, she's running. Uh, and Pete and I just thought, like, let's, let's just send back and forth a few of the tweets that yeah. we particularly like. So I'll start off. I've kind of ranked mine in uh, ascending order of just <laughs> craziness. But anyway, I want to do... Uh, let's let... Okay, this one coming from 2016. Let's all of us give birth to more love in the world today and then tomorrow too and then the day after that. Yeah. I don't want to give birth every day. That, that's, that seems literally the most painful thing in the history of the planet and she's saying I need to do it every day. Like specifically give birth. Give birth. It's quite a labour-intensive way of putting forward that yeah, idea. Just, how about just speak it? Yeah, spread a little love. <laughs> yeah, just some, It's got to be another part of the body that the love can come out of. Be, ne be nice to a co-worker. Yeah, exactly. No, like, no, do this give, give birth. This Go into labour. Spend eight hours in a hospital. Yeah, this massively painful thing. Yep. Anyway, that's what she used. I what and this is to go to keep going with the birth thing. Yep. Yin is feminine, earth. Yang is masculine, sky. When God is seen as He, the soul is seen as She. Just archetypes. Spirit impregnates soul. Ooh, that is bonkers. <laughs> I don't know. I've never looked at the sky and thought that's a man. Yeah. <laughs> Or the earth, and like that's a woman. Although yeah. you hear Mother Earth, I suppose. But um, yeah, what spring it, spirit impregnates soul. Yeah, that's, that's stop thinking that about. Sounds, so someone's in, like inside my body. Someone isn't being impregnated right now, as we speak. Terrifying. Uh, I've got another one here. Uh, in, oh, okay, sorry, this is a good one. Uh, now we all want our political figures to be up to date with the great works of economics. Like if you're on the if you're on the centre right. I want you to have read Adam Smith or Hayek, and if you're on the left, I want you to have read you know, Piketty and stuff like that. For economic books. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, what's economics? I'd text a Darcy before this. <laughs> but anyway, you want to be across economics, right? Yeah. Well, so, and I'm glad that Marianne Williamson is, because here's one from 2013. Income inequality in America isn't just unethical or immoral, it is unsustainable. Anyone who has read Yertle the Turtle already knows this. <laughs> that has to be a joke. Uh, Surely that's a joke. I don't think Marianne jokes. <laughs> But um, <laughs> Yertle the turtle. Is that? A, are we familiar with that? I'm not, not that is a children's book. Okay. On the on the concept of stacking turtles. Yeah. It's like but a Doctor Seuss with a message though yeah. about income inequality. The thing I like about made Marianne, more sense than Piketty. Well, uh, yeah, I had a few factual errors, but the thing about Marianne I like is that she's an old school crazy person hippie. Yeah. She's not like you know like she's AOC, your mum's friend that makes jewelry now and has a yoga class. Yeah. And she's just bonkers, and we love her. She, all she wants to do is spread love. AOC. She's dangerous, right? Yeah. You know, she's going to restructure America's economy. Marianne's just bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> and I love her. Can we keep going? Did you have any more? I said one more. Right. Humanity needs a mental shower. We need to wash off all prejudices of the 20th century and stand naked 
beneath the waters of eternal truths. So all of mankind just standing naked there's around a lot each of, other. There's a lot of nudity, there's a lot of pregnancy. <laughs> she just is a little bit freaky and yeah. I like it. <laughs> Glad someone does. I've got all right. Uh, this is a two for right here. Okay. Uh, if you want a simple explanation for what's happening in America, watch Avatar again. Yeah. Now no. that might be good advice because if you want to look at like the death of America's culture, then you do need to watch Avatar because mm. Avatar is a below average film. Yeah. Uh, and then all all of the films were good, but Avatar has changed the world. He didn't win an Oscar tonight, but James Cameron deserves a Nobel Peace Prize. Well, amen. Did, like Avatar stuck. I'm sorry. Like it looked good. Mm-hmm. The visuals were fantastic. That movie's trash. Well, look, I can't really remember that much about it. I have like, seen it. If Avatar is genuinely your favourite movie, then also your favourite pizza is just the crust. Like, no, like the, crust the crust of another pizza. <laughs> yeah, but it's not your favourite. You're not like, if everyone's like, oh, what are we ordering for pizza tonight? You're like, order whatever, I'll eat your crust. Okay. Like, that is saying we should watch Avatar tonight. Yeah, well, you know. And then my favourite one, the power of your mind is greater than the power of nuclear radiation. Visualise angels dispersing it into nothingness. Now, people are worried about Trump might lead us into a nuclear war. <laughs> How about someone that doesn't believe it's a problem? Yeah. If you can just think it, the bomb will melt in the sky and be replaced with angels. It's comforting. It's a comforting thought. Uh, but I'd back our enemies I in don't that particular think, fight. I don't think we need a little bit more teeth around that policy, Marianne. Yep. Visualise angels dispersing it into nothing. Anyway, what's going to happen to her? Is she, like, is she rating well or is she... Look, uh, she's not rating well. She'll probably drop out soon. But She's rating better now, though. She's... <laughs> she's she- Generating buzz. We're talking about. It. I mean, we didn't. I'd never heard of her I had, this weekend. I had never heard of her at all, and now she's all I can think about. Uh, if I'm the t- like, I don't care if she drops out of the election. Uh, I'm if I'm the TV producer for the next Democratic debate. She's my first invite before yeah. Biden, before uh, Bernie Sanders. I want Marion Williamson on stage. I want Marion Williamson on stage with Trump and the Democratic nominee. Just Marion yeah. Williamson, just like the voice of aging hippies. She should go as an independent candidate if she doesn't make it. Yeah. Uh, and I will personally fund the case. I don't care how much money I spiral myself into in debt. You tell me a Trump well, versus Marion Williamson debate wouldn't be the best thing you've ever I seen on Mar- TV. Marion's going to have a few guest spots on the Young IPA podcast. Oh, standing invite. Standing invite. All right, let's move on. So ScoMo. We're talking about Scott Morrison, Australian PM, obviously. <laughs> of, um, of which ScoMo do you speak? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Prime Minister. Now, he met the, the Prime Minister of India over the weekend, Narendra Modi, because he's at the G20 summit in Osaka and, and, and saw the Indian Prime Minister. Having said that, he wrote, Kitha, he tweeted at Modi, Kithana Acha He Modi, how good is Modi in Hindi, right? So he's obviously going with the how good is yeah, thing. Yeah, how good is thing. Yep, yeah, so that's his thing. Modi tweeted back, mate, I'm stoked about the energy of our bilateral relationship which is obviously written in Bogan. So yep. Modi has captured the Aussie Bogan language really well. Yeah, mate, I'm stoked. And then Scott Morrison replied to it with Sco Modi. Uh, now, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hashtag. You sort of went over Sco there. Sco You sort of buried Sco Modi. Sco Modi. Yeah, get it? Yeah. Do you get it? I get it. I get it. <laughs> it's Sco Modi, but then Modi. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, there is only one person in politics that has actually grasped the art of social media, and that is Donald Trump. Because wow. the rest of it has is as it? cringeworthy as possible. Like that... That, like, mate, I'm stoked, Sco Modi, all this other stuff is the greatest argument for isolationism I've ever seen. Like, this has set back the concept of international relations years. James. The massive amount of cringe. This is, like, I've got it. This is the most damaging blow to the concept of diplomacy since Hitler invaded Russia. Okay. Yeah, well, that's quite, yeah, that's quite a big call, James. I would say that your opinion is wrong. Okay. And that we love this stuff because normally all the political you know, good blokes or good women, do you know what I mean? Like the authentic people are lefties. Yeah. You know, Justin Trudeau, what a guy, he went to a Pride March. Jacinda Ardern, how, you know, she's a great woman, blah, blah, blah. ScoMo is in serious danger of actually being quite likable. And it just, I enjoy that because you can tell it would drive the lefties wild. And I, I normally hate this stuff. You know, I, ScoMo. I find it incredibly cringeworthy. Okay. And I don't think either of them have any say in what gets on their Twitter page. I think it is a intern that downloaded Twitter two weeks ago and they're like, well, hashtags work apparently. And then that's what's happening. Well, I guess me and you will have to disagree and yep. that is life. Okay, yep. so who's doing Glastonbury? All right, I've got this. So okay. Glastonbury Festival, we talked about Storm- Stormzy earlier in the yeah. show. Uh, there was a sign that got viral uh, because Glastonbury, the official Glastonbury Live Twitter handle posted it. Uh, it is the photo from uh, Vampire Weekend's new album, which by the way, classic. Mm-hmm. That album, out of control good. Mm. Anyway, uh, mm. I didn't see any borders, do you? And it's like a picture of the world. Mm. It's posted on a fence. It is posted on a fence. Now, I don't know if you know what a fence is, Pete. But fences are usually 
something to mark a, as a borderline mm. between two different areas. A demarcation, yeah. if you will. In fact, uh, the this fence on Glastonbury is the difference between people that have paid no money to be in a room yeah. and people who have paid a lot of money. It is. Yeah. And it's and it's it is demark it is the uh, device yep. of an organization that is making a huge amount of money yep. out of like public institution public cultural institutions. Yes. So so for to them to uh, actually be telling us Yeah, to answer the question, the I don't see any borders, do you? Mm. I do see a border. I see a border. I see the border that you are on. Front and center. Also it's a it's a uh, it is an image of the natural natural world. Yep. Now as an Australian, I must say that natural borders Yep. Are a thing. There are a lot of borders. So I do there's see a border borders. between land and sea. I can see borders on the, the globe. So I've got them on a technicality there as well. <laughs> Glastonbury. Take can you that. stop saying Glastonbury, by the way? We're not in America. So anyway, uh, that's it for Glastonbury. Uh, <laughs> did you have any other stories, Pete? I did. You might have noticed during the week that the president... Oh, I was of- watching Glastonbury. <laughs> I didn't notice anything. You are just... Everything that's wrong with this country. So, uh, Donald so Trump. This is diplomacy. It's no hashtag ScoModi or anything. Yeah. That's that's diplomacy. Before, behind closed doors, they would have been hard at it. Anyway, Kim, Donald Trump, President of the United States, met with Kim Jong Un, President of North Korea or Supreme Leader, whatever they call him. Uh, Grand Poobah. Yeah, probably. He took a break from the. So Trump took a break from the G20 summit in Osaka, and for a few minutes shook hands with the North Korea on the northern side of the DMZ. Yeah. Which who I, else? Who among us has never wanted to just you know. Brush off a conference meeting by heading over to North Korea. Oh, look, we've all skipped the old conference session, <laughs> yeah. haven't we? I didn't meet the bloody no, I haven't. president of <laughs> they North watch Korea. This feed. <laughs> Do they? Anyway, the demilitarized, demilitar- I'm never going to say it, the demilitarized zone. Glastonbury. And before a hastily arranged meeting on the southern side at the, at the Peace Village. Now, I know there's, there's, there's dip- diplomatic things about this, you know, should he have met him, shouldn't he have met him? I don't care about that, right? I want to talk about how, how much I would love to have been a fly on the wall in that room where we've got Trump, who's Trump, mm-hmm. and this guy who's got to be a weirdo. You know, being a supreme leader <laughs> makes you a weirdo. Yeah. No one disagrees with you. Everyone thinks that you're going to kill them. It's a weird dynamic. Remember when, like the last time they met when Trump was like, make sure you get on this photo so it's, it's our good angle. And yeah. no one had ever said that he had a bad angle. Yeah, no, he said, no, he said, make sure you don't make us look fat. Ha ha ha. Yeah. You know, big gag to the photographers. And he's like, what? what what's going on? Hang on, what? Am I fat? Which yeah. he is. He's quite fat. That <laughs> the only thing I've got is that I walked into the room and saw Trump and Kim Jong-un standing next to each other. Mm. And I just had one of those moments of like, imagine showing myself that photo <laughs> six years ago. Yeah, exactly. it's just so much things exactly. that my brain would be like, wait, what? Things have changed, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. But I, watch, I saw it and I'm like, oh, that's happening now. Like, that's where I'm at. I'm just, yeah. I just see Trump and North Korea stand by side. Yeah. And I just go, oh, that's a thing that's Barely happening. Barely made the news. That's, that's, that is now a thing that I know, is Amer- that that is happening. American president who used to be a reality TV star wandered into North Korea on the yep. weekend. And it's like the last <laughs> thing we're talking about. Yeah. It's Second like, oh, by the way, oh, and now we'll cut to a moose. Like, yeah. that's, like that's where it is in the news thing. Wild stuff. All right, uh, last one I got. So this is a very good report that's come out of France. Uh, oh. Yep. Classic what? report. Classic report. Okay, so French civil service, long known for its ability to just keep people on the payroll. Uh, at least 30 go- French ghost civil servants have been paid more than £22 million pounds annually to do absolutely nothing for the last three decades, a new report has revealed. Yep. So they come to work. Some of them don't even come to work, but they get paid because there's just no oversight. Mm, that's it's right. It's brilliant. They're finished. They're like, I think it's one particular office and that office has been closed. Yep. And the, the crazy thing about this is... It's not even a glitch. Yeah. It's like, no, nah, it was in their agreement. Yeah. We just have to pay them for We just have to pay them. It's not Move even to like, France. It's, Move to France. Well, yeah, and get a job in the civil service, but it's not even like a computer error. It's like, no, nah, this is what they've signed up for. Yeah. Uh, I got the one here. So one civil servant, a former rugby star who played mm. for Toulon, ran a restaurant rather than going to council office every day. He was summoned on at least one occasion to explain his business because it appeared incompatible with the status of a civil servant, but the salary checks kept arriving. Yeah. Yeah, because I reckon he's a former rugby player. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that was all the things they needed to discuss. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, do you really want to cancel that? Yeah. I'm much bigger than you. Well, that that could have been a factor. But the thing, I like, at least he was doing something. Yeah. You know, he was running just, a restaurant. He wasn't sitting there going, sacre bleu, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they do do that a lot. And then eat begets. That's right. I don't know. So, but apparently, these, I mean, having been at the IPA a few years, these stories pop up every now and then. Yeah, brilliant. All right. Oh. Uh, that is it for the show this week. <laughs> Thank you to Rod Kemp and Andrew Bolt for their appearances. Uh, oh, and uh, we want to make sure. All okay, right, so friend of the show, Jacinda Price, is on a speaking tour upcoming around Australia. Head on over to True Arrow Events if you want to hear from her. Uh, that's going to be an absolutely unmissable event. So to go do that. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast. Go check out Looking Forward if you haven't already. Make sure you subscribe to both and telling friends and family, etc. 
Cool. See you guys next week. I'm about to cough. See you up.